Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Philip Yun. Um, I'm the CEO of World Affairs, and I just wanted to welcome everyone to our dial-in Zoom program, and it's titled Technology and Privacy in the Time of COVID-19, something that's very uh, relevant to where we are right now. We're here in San Francisco, uh, and we are here in our 10th week of sheltering in. My kids are way over there on that side, and I'm in the back room um, making do with what we've got right here. I hope uh, your loved ones and your family are all staying safe and, and well. So World Affairs has made a huge pivot. We have gone from being really doing live programs in person to doing things that are very much remote. And I wanted to thank everyone who has put this together, made this possible um, uh, to, to be able to do this so quickly um, over the last several weeks. Uh, I, I wanted to thank you all for joining our conversation here and our panel with uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh Raskar, who is uh, from the MIT Media Lab. We have Dr. George Rutherford, who is from UCSF. And we also have Dakota Gruner, who's the executive director of ID2020. So I've got a, a really good job. My, mine is really easy because my job is to get out of here <laughs> as quickly as possible. So what I will do is just uh, give you some really short um, bios. Um, I think all of you have received them. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background for each of our panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Ramesh Raskar. He's the associate professor at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he leads uh, the project for Safe Paths. He holds over 90 patents in computer vision, computational health, sensors, and imaging. And he works extensively and is leading a project on artificial intelligence. So we've got the technology side covered very, very well. We also have uh, Dr. George Rutherford, who is a professor um, at uh, the UCSF Medical School, University of California Medical School. Uh, he's worked extens extensively in public health with an emphasis on epidemiology, uh, control of communicable diseases, both domestically and internationally. And he's got a number of uh, chairs um, and titles that I won't go through, but just let's say that uh, he's very well known to me and the people here in San Francisco because he is leading the effort from my little vantage point because uh, my wife has been involved in the contact tracing here that we are, uh, that is being um, put, put together from what I understand in rather rapid fashion and has made extraordinary strides in us lowering and flattening the curve. So thank you, Dr. Ruff, for being with us. And then finally, um, we have Dakota Gruner, who is the executive director of ID2020. Um, she is a, uh, uh, ID2020 is a global private partnership that promotes the adoption and ethical implementation of user managed um, <clears throat> private pr privacy protection and portable digital identity solutions. Um, and ID2020 works with governments and civil society to ensure that the world's 7 billion people can fully exercise their basic human rights and participate in the modern economy. And she just recently wrote a white paper dealing with immunity certificates. Um, if we have them, we must do it right. And um, so with that, I think the format that we're going to use, I believe, is that uh, we wanted everyone to start off with uh, some um, opening comments with the idea that that would stimulate conversation among everyone. And then we'll, we'll uh, open it up for your questions, uh, maybe in about 20 minutes or so, okay? So I believe Dr. Rutherford, um, please go ahead. Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you today and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I was asked to give a little bit of a review of some of the basic science around uh, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the organism that causes the disease. So the, uh, the disease is caused by a, a beta coronavirus. The other two human beta coronaviruses that we've seen are the original SARS from 2002, 2003, and something called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which emerged from Saudi Arabia um, in, or I think, I believe 2012. These, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, the SARS coronavirus 2, uh, descended from a bat lineage uh, in southern China, southern or central China, uh, much as, as SARS, the original SARS probably did as well. Um, there are a whole bunch of, of bat coronaviruses that have crossed over into humans, 
but SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 are the three that we, uh, we worry about. The coronavirus looks like a crown. That's why it's called a coronavirus. It has spikes off of it. And the spikes, prosaically called the spike protein or the S protein, have a binding site on them uh, that fits into a receptor on the cells of the, uh, of the uh, uh, respiratory epithelium, the respiratory lining of the respiratory tract, uh, and also the gastrointestinal tract. And this is called an angiotensin converting enzyme type two receptor, an ACE2 receptor. That's only because I feel I figure a few people in your in the audience take uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So don't worry, you're not protected or you're not made worse by that. So you know, give it a break. Um, this uh, this virus uh, is an RNA virus. It's a large RNA virus. Um, and one of the reasons it's large is that it's had as its enzyme so it can repair its own DNA. So it's not prone to a lot of mutations like some of the, unlike some of the smaller RNA viruses. So that's just a little fact. <clears throat> the problem with this virus is that it doesn't uh, confer lifelong immunity to everyone. And it probably doesn't confer lifelong immunity at all. The at least 20% um, of people, 10 to 20% of people who have the full-blown syndrome of uh, COVID-19 and are in the hospital and have, uh, have multiple positive tests, 10 to 20% of them do not develop antibody. An additional number of people uh, do not develop the kind of antibodies we want to see, which are called neutralizing antibodies, which are ones that are most important for protecting uh, you in the future against uh, reinfection or re-exposure. Or if you've never been infected before, those are the kinds of antibodies we want to raise with, uh, with immunizations. So we have a disease, that uh, a widespread disease, that has a severe clinical form uh, that doesn't really confer antibody protection in lots of people. Now, it probably confers it in maybe, at least transiently, in maybe 60, maybe 70% of people. But the problem is that we don't know which, which, those, which people those are. Uh, so the fact that you have an antibody, you have the presence of antibodies, doesn't tell us whether you're immune or not, whether you're infected, whether you're protected against um, future infection or not. Uh, I was also asked to say a couple of words about, um, about testing. There are three types of tests we have for this. One is the nasal swab, the ones that we feel like you're having a brain biopsy. Uh, when they do it, uh, and those are called uh, those are called polymerase chain reactions. Those are actually looking for the presence of the virus's RNA. Those can those turn positive about three days post exposure, on on average, and can stay positive for maybe up to fourteen days afterwards. There's some intermittent shedding. There's a lot of funny business that goes on with it that I can speak to. The antibody tests don't turn positive until at least 11 days uh, after infection. So they're really useless for diagnosing the disease acutely. And because they really can't differentiate immunity from who's immune from who's not immune, they're mostly um, you know, beloved by people like me who are epidemiologists who use them to follow around where the virus has been and what the burden of disease has been in the population. And finally, very recently we have tests for, that measure the presence of the virus directly for viral antigen. Those really are only just coming on the market now, and we don't have a ton of experience with them. So, we, so the way we control this virus is through traditional public health methods. All the things you heard, wash your hands, you know, cover your cough, stay home if you're sick, all that stuff. Plus, now masks are, seem to be are, are much more important as we've understood better how masks work and the um, and the role of people with asymptomatic infection, again, maybe 50% of people don't have symptoms, maybe 40%, some number like that. And they're particularly important in some of the transmission studies that we've seen. Um, so those are some of the other uh, things that we're, uh, we're seeing. Um, but, the, but beyond kind of what individuals can do, it's what public health does. You know, so we can move, as we move away from shelter in place, we have to replace it with something. We're going to replace it with masks first and foremost. That's something you can do personally, and then secondly, with uh, more vigorous contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. And I can speak to all those things. But there's a rough kind of overview, and uh, take it away. Okay. Thank Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ramesh. 
uh, I mean, Ramesh uh, Raskar, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Phil. And George, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, the goal here is to think about how can we use digital technology for contact tracing and beyond. And a, a typical contact tracing would involve manual contact tracing, as, as George described. The hope is that by using technologies such as GPS and Bluetooth and anything else that allow us to figure out if two individuals are right next to each other, uh, we might be able to use that to create a somewhat automated mechanism that if one person gets infected, then everybody else who came in contact with them can also be informed very quickly that they may have been exposed. And those individuals can go ahead and then call their doctor, call their public health and say, hey, I just got a message that I have been exposed and can I, can I just go get a test or what should I do next? Should I self-quarantine <clears throat> and so on? So this seems like a, a great dream uh, for us to, uh, to be able to do that. The challenge, unfortunately, is that any digital technology will quickly lead to a surveillance state uh, and a big brother. Not only that will kind of infringe on personal freedom, but the moment individual real, re, individuals realize that this could, be, uh, this could be an issue for you know, downstream challenges such as identity breach or job discrimination and so on, they will stop using these technologies uh, and they'll refuse to participate uh, in this mechanism that in reality could be fantastic for, for, for contact tracing. So the, the challenge has been, so this has been true in a lot of Asian countries where there were top-down systems with enough carrots and sticks for people to use such a system. A common stick uh, was that unless you use an app that tells you you're in the clear and you're not exposed, you won't be allowed to use public transport or get into government buildings and so on. And that forced people to use such apps, but then people figure out how to misuse them or how to get around them and so on. So the challenge in kind of democratic country is how can you create a solution that of course is great with respect to technology, but also is privacy preserving and, and uh, you know, doesn't infringe on personal freedom. So what we have been working on uh, at MIT is exactly that, which is how can you use technologies like GPS and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, as a, either a smartphone app or using some other methods uh, to find proximity, but then very quickly get into the other important problems for public health. The next problem is contact tracing, where we want the public health, as Josh described, and Philip, as your wife probably does this, you know, call the people who need help and understand where, what were you doing? You know, where were you? Where you're at a social event or where you're at a grocery store? If you're at a grocery store, where you're wearing a mask or where you're, where you're keeping a social distance uh, or where you're at a wedding and, and so on. And based on that scenario, you know, they can make the, make the process faster. So contact tracing, which is aiding existing manual contact tracing with digital tools uh, becomes very easy. But even those two problems are also just a tiny piece of the bigger puzzle because the very next thing you want to do is some kind of a trudge decide whether they should get test or not, eligible to get a test or not, what's the nearest site, schedule them, how do you provide telehealth, if you quarantine, how do we verify that they're actually maintaining self-quarantine, how can we create enough incentives, so first we'll give them you know, clear certificates the moment they're going to quarantine, if they come out of quarantine, how do we let, let them to go back to work, uh, and of course, how do you close the loop with public health so that uh, they can coordinate, orchestrate, the uh, infected, exposed, and healthy individuals uh, in a way that doesn't burden uh, in this unique times. So, so MIT Safe Paths is doing, we have launched a nonprofit uh, called PathCheck that's launching a lot of solutions and so on. And the way we are approaching this problem is, of course, bringing a lot of technologists, epidemiologists, and lawyers, and privacy experts uh, in, this, in this mix. Uh, and our goal is not to really compete. We are not here to kind of push an app or a software solution. Uh, what we have done is we have created a very large uh, base uh, of, of open source code. Uh, and with these experts like privacy law epidemiologist, uh, we help many countries and many states launch their own solutions. Um, and because we are a nonprofit uh, and open source, we're able to do this in a very rapid way. And a lot of our conversations are then shaped by WHO and CDC and HHS uh, and others who guide what kind of methodology should be supported. And then we have a pretty large team now uh, who work full time 
to continue to build the solutions and do a lot of hand holding. And so we do a lot of pilots uh, in countries and workplaces. We have pilots going on at MIT campus, certain hospital and workplaces, as well as in you know bigger health uh, jurisdictions. The challenge here, Philip, really is this: all of this could have been done by a software company overnight. That's not a big deal. The 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 key idea here is, and the magic here is how you do this in a privacy-preserving way. You know, if you think about the analogy, I would give is you know 20 years ago, if you had to use a credit card on a online browser, internet browser, you would be very worried about it. But today we see the icon in HTTP and that S gives us the confidence that when I type the credit card number on this website, actually it's gonna be secure. And even the website itself doesn't know what my credit card number is. And we have to create the same level of confidence when it comes to solving this very public health problem. Unfortunately, you know, a country like ours and else, we were, they're not prepared for, for this kind of a challenge. So we need to have the right combination of software and epidemiology to really solve these uh, problems together. So I would say safe parts at MIT really has kind of three verticals. We have a think tank, uh, we have a, sorry, technology, we have a think tank, and we have implementation piece. In the, in, the, in the technology, we have algorithms and apps and open source code, and maybe most importantly, we have interoperability, because as I said, we are not here to compete and push one solution, but help everybody else build their solutions. So they should also be interoperable. On the think tank, you know, we write um, documents about privacy and ethics guidelines, what is interoperable protocol should be, a landscape of what's going on. So we talk to CDC all the time and they quote us in, in their documentation. And then on the implementation, which is done through the nonprofit, uh, we work very closely with health jurisdiction, training material, coordination material that's provided to them, a lot of handholding, uh, you know, and also we work with a lot of solution providers and solution seekers, like large companies as well as startups and innovate, and bring them on a platform. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, we'll hear from Dakota, but there are players who come in with solutions for identity or solutions for open leisure, solution for thermal IR cameras and internet connected thermometers or new serology tests that, are, that can be in the digital platform. So we bring a lot of these partners as well onto our platform so that they can plug in into this larger ecosystem. And we think that, you know, kind of in summary, this problem would be very easy to solve if there's a bird's eye view by a government in everything that's going on. Who's meeting who, uh, who's maintaining social distancing, you know, are, you know, which, who's, doing, who's doing the tests and which tests are effective, uh, should we do immunity passports or not? If we had a bird's eye view into everything that's going on, we can probably solve this epidemic overnight. But the challenge is because of privacy and consent and dignity, regulation and trade secrets and even national secrets, uh, we are not able to do this. So if we can do that in a privacy preserving way, then if we can in fact create this bird's eye view and that would be fantastic for orchestration by large governments and big businesses. At the same time, it gives abilities for communities and individuals to coordinate among themselves so nobody's infringing on their freedom. So in the short term, it's about public health. In the medium term, it's about you know, solving how do we get back to work. In the long term, it's really about creating resilient societies. Thank you. Great, thanks. So Dr. Um, Professor Askar talked about <coughs> technology and technology-assisted contact tracing. So now, uh, Dakota, um, you know, you also will talk, I guess, you know, your thing is technology, but I think really in the, in the digital health certificate. So now we're sort of combining both the technology piece and the public health perspective. So why don't you go ahead? Thank you so much for having me. Um, so, you know, I wanted to start by, you know, sort of highlighting, I think, two large buckets of you know, sort of technology tools that we're seeing deployed for COVID-19. Um, and the first is certainly contact tracing, um, you know, as, as Ramesh has described and, you know, as we're seeing um, being deployed sort of around the world, um, programs designed to basically say, how do we mitigate contact by those who are infected? Um, and so it's really a question of sort of, you know, managing the infection and reducing risk. The second major bucket of, you know, technology tools, you know, interventions that we are hearing discussed quite frequently um, really are around, you know, how do we prove that those who are healthy um, are healthy um, and therefore have, you know, a right to go back to work, to go back to sort of their public, um, their public lives. 
Um, and with this, you know, one concept that has been getting a significant amount of attention um, in recent weeks has been this idea of an immunity passport or an immunity certificate. Um, you know, as I think it's really important to note, as Dr. Rutherford just shared, um, you know, the term immunity passport or immunity certificate is a really imprecise and probably misleading term. Um, you know, the science of immunity at this point is not proven. Um, and what we're seeing is that when people are talking about immunity passports, generally what they are thinking of is much more sort of a digital health certificate of some variety, um, you know, which be inclusive of both you know, verifiable proof of somebody's recent negative test results, um, you know, perhaps using PCR testing, proof of vaccination once a COVID-19 vaccine becomes available, and you know, proof of immunity only if immunity does you know, turn out to be scientifically proven. Um, these programs are moving forward rapidly. We're seeing them in the UK, in British Columbia, Germany, Chile, um, in California. There's authorizing legislation being heard in the state assembly. Um, and so these projects, you know, we see um, you know, just tremendous currency to them at the moment. Um, we believe it's pretty safe to assume that immunity passport programs will indeed be launched somewhere. Um, and you know, sort of, you may be asking, why is ID2020 as an organization that's focused on digital ID involved in this discussion around immunity passports? Um, and so, very quickly, you know, like you said, we're a global public-private partnership focused on digital identity, and specifically on digital ID that's user-managed, privacy-protecting, and portable. Um, we bring together governments, the private sector, and civil society to set standards. Um, you know, this speaks to Ramesh's point around interoperability. Um, and build trust so that we can maximize the potential of digital ID while mitigating the risks. Um, most of our work historically has focused on you know, the over 1 billion people who lack any form of identity at the moment um, and therefore lack access to vital services, aren't able to exercise their rights as citizens or voters, participate in modern economy, et cetera. But when we talk about digital ID, really what we're talking about is digital credentialing. Um, it's, you know, how does somebody take a credential issued to them by a third party um, and you know, turn up someplace else and share that digital credential in a manner that is recognized and trusted. Um, and you know, I think we can all agree right now that digital identity is profoundly broken. Um, you know, I think almost everyone on this webinar probably has hundreds if not thousands of usernames and passwords. Those are useful only for a single website. Um, and we've all experienced the loss of you know, personally identifiable information due to hacking, our breach. You know, our data ends up not being our own. Um, it's stored and managed by multitudes of siloed organizations, and um, you know, and we don't have the portability of being able to take a credential from one place and share it someplace else. So, you know, what ID twenty twenty has done over the last you know however many years, um, four years, is really try and define the principles and norms that we believe are vital for good digital ID. Um, these ideas around privacy, user management, portability. And what we found is that you know, when we think about the various technologies that might aid in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, the concerns were fundamentally the same, and particularly around immunity certificates, where um, you know, we really are talking about digital credentialing. Um, with digital credentialing, you know, I think there are a lot of very reasonable criticisms of the concept that should make us skeptical or cautious around the concept. Um, you know, broadly, these fall into sort of two buckets. Um, the first are technical concerns relating to privacy and the security of sensitive data. I mean, there's nothing I can imagine that's sort of more sensitive right now than somebody's COVID health status. Um, and, you know, the second are really sort of non-technical concerns relating to inclusion and, and equity. Um, on the technical side, um, and I, you know, first I want to say that we don't think technology in any instance is a panacea. Um, but we do think that many of these technical concerns can be addressed um, and that technology can be deployed that is privacy protecting. And you know, thank you to Ramesh for leading the charge um, you know, on that for the, for the contact tracing side. Um, for immunity certificates, what we think is important is you know, that decentralized interoperable technology is used, um, you know, that the information remains in the hands of the individual, um, and that they have very granular and selective control over who, the, you know, what they share and with, with whom. Um, what gets much, much trickier are some of the non-technical questions. Um, you know, some of the, the key concerns that we've been working to address with our partners, you know, technology companies, nonprofits, and governments, 
include things like the availability and access to testing. Um, and when we think about somebody being given a verifiable certificate that they're you know, unlikely to be infectious, um, therefore can go back to work, that's an incredibly valuable asset. Um, and so if we have inequities in terms of who can get access to testing, um, you know, we're only exacerbating those inequities um, because for those who then you know, can prove their status. So you know, as sort of a foundational piece, um, accessible, convenient, and low-cost testing is absolutely um, a must. Um, you know, I think, again, going back to something that Dr. Rutherford said earlier, um, you know, the accuracy of testing is really important. Um, you know, if you have these certificates and the tests themselves are inaccurate, um, you know, you're providing somebody with what's seen as a very high veracity certificate, you know, where the test results themselves may be in question. Um, and, you know, and I think that's sort of a, a big concern we have, um, you know, is the potential that, you know, if somebody was struggling to make ends meet, perhaps, or maybe just, you know, generally, um, you know, that if we have a system that privileges or even suggests to privilege immunity in any way, um, you know, that could, that could lead some to sort of roll the dice and potentially risk infection. Um, you know, they say, I much prefer to get this over with. Um, and of course, that has, you know, not only real concerns for their individual health, but also concerns in terms of our ability, the health system um, to, manage, to manage infection. Um, all this to say, this is a very, very complicated space. Um, it's one where, you know, it's, it's vital that, you know, the technical safeguards are built in, as well as many of these key considerations um, around implementing such a program. And so what we've done is you know, develop a variant of ID2020's certification initiative, um, specifically oriented to guide the development of digital ID certificates, um, digital health certificates. Um, the idea is that, you know, we, we know that health authorities are in the process of reviewing you know, hundreds of different applications for, um, you know, technical tools that they can apply in the context of COVID-19. And frankly, it's hard to discern between those, even when you've got tons of time. Um, but in this context where, you know, the immediate pandemic response is naturally, um, you know, sort of taking precedent, um, wanting to make it very easy um, for, you know, for health authorities, for businesses, for those who are thinking about rolling out these programs to identify which of the solutions that are being proffered to them meet best practices um, for privacy, security, et cetera. And you know, the flip side of that, of course, is that we can then incentivize the tech companies um, by saying basically, here, you know, here's a gold star um, that you can, you can market yourself with um, if you've met these criteria. Um, the other piece is developing a toolkit. And this, you know, I think goes back to something that Ramesh just discussed, which is, um, you know, governments and, and health authorities, others really need guidance right now on how to roll out these programs well. And so to the extent that we can provide um, some of that ethically grounded, technically literate guidance um, and make it easy to walk through some of those key concerns, um, that's something that we've been, you know, we've been developing. All right. Um, thanks to the panel for, uh, you know, a great set of inter uh, introductory remarks for us to, and the audience to think about and sort of set the table for a number of questions that are coming in. This is clearly a very complex issue. And because ID2020 has been working closely with governments, technology providers, and other stakeholders, um, we've asked, we thought it would be best if maybe Dakota uh, took the lead in the discussion and questions. And so all of you have the ability to uh, go in the chat and post questions, and I think several of you have already done so, and please continue to do that. Uh, and what I will do here is just ask Dakota, why don't you go ahead and take the lead, okay? Great. So quickly, I see a handful of questions that have come in through the Q&A. Um, please would you know, encourage you to continue sending those in. I'll do my best to, to collate those and, um, and then feed them back to, to Dr. Rutherford and Dr. Ruskar. Um, perhaps one question just to, you know, to kick us off, um, and this may be the, the elephant in the room, but um, you know, Dr. Rutherford, what do you think we should be expecting over the next couple of months and into the fall in terms of you know, continued sheltered in place and you know, with that expectations for the need um, for such of these um, you know, digital tools? Sure, well, at least here in Northern California, uh, we're seeing a, uh, a gradual loosening up of the shelter in place uh, orders. A number of counties in more or less rural California now almost almost certainly to include Napa in the next day or so. 
um, have backed away from this and have moved into so-called phase two with low risk kinds of uh, interactions, uh, commercial interactions permitted. Um, and uh, they're well on their way to moving to the second part of, of uh, the second stage, which is not called 2B by the way, it's just two. Um, and it's, we'll see how that goes. Um, this is a disease with a short incubation period on the order of five days. So if there are cases that are gonna occur, you'll see them occurring fairly, uh, fairly quickly. What I fully expect to happen in Northern California is that we'll see a continued decline or you know, a plateau at a relatively lower level of cases uh, going out into the summer uh, and into the early fall with occasional outbreaks uh, that uh, the contact tracing is specifically designed to pick up. Uh, we'll also have a number of research studies that are uh, running and they'll find a number of people who have asymptomatic infection who would not have presented for testing otherwise unless we would have caught them in contact tracing. So all those things are gonna to lead to a fair amount of activity around testing and trying to identify chains of transmission. When we get into the later fall though, it's a crapshoot. We don't really know what's exactly, what exactly the roles of schools are. Uh, the role of schools in influenza A is very clear. Elementary schools are huge amplifiers of influenza A transmission. And that's one of the reasons that people were so quick to move to closing schools uh, for this disease as a, as a primary prevention tool. Um, it, may, it may or may not happen that way. Um, there are data on both sides. None of, none of the data are very good, uh, but we'll just have to see how that plays out. There may be better data over the summer. And I'm involved in at least a couple of studies trying to fish those data out uh, right now. So you, you're gonna get away from shelter in place. You'll be moving towards um, a more quote unquote normal existence uh, towards the mid end of the summer. Uh, and then we'll have to see what happens when school starts. Now by quote unquote normal, I mean you're gonna be wearing masks when you go outside. I would certainly hope so. Uh, you're gonna have to maintain social distancing and it's gonna seem awkward and weird to be in a restaurant with a mask on, not that you're supposed to eat or drink through your mask, but, um, but you know, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna seem weird, uh, yeah, but it's the, uh, wearing masks is hugely important. And, you know, I think that's gonna be sort of our primary personal barrier and then contact tracing and all this other stuff we're talking about today is gonna to be the primary public health structural intervention. So perhaps one very quick um, follow-up question to you on that. And I'll admit this is a bit of a, um, it's very central to the work that we're doing. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, as scientists are working to understand, you know, the, the virus and, you know, sort of whether it does confer immunity, how long do you think it'll take for scientists to kind of answer those questions in a, um, in a way that, you know, feels decided to some extent. And, you know, and then I think maybe a follow on is, you know, if digital health certificates were used for proof of a recent diagnostic test, so, you know, PCR active infection, how frequently do you think people would need to be retested? Well, that's a $64,000 question, right? Um, in terms of how, when we'll know how, how long it's, how long will it be till we really understand immunity? It'll be a long time. We'll have the vaccine before we understand completely about the immunity, about immunity. Obviously, it's going to continue to evolve over the summer and into the fall as these large studies get put together and we're able to follow people uh, through ex re-exposure and, you know, kind of constant exposures like healthcare workers. But that's going to take a, take a while to get really figured out. Um, I'm sorry, the second part was... The second part was around, you know, for, for a negative diagnostic test. Oh, yeah, okay, you know, okay. So, so the answer is three days, but that's not a good answer. So what we're doing in nursing homes, which are the highest of the highest risk, you know, people who take care of the frail elderly, um, we're uh, going to be uh, testing them every two weeks. Now, why not every one week? Because, you know, because it takes twice as many tests. Why every two weeks? Because it's more frequently than every four weeks. It's a, you have to sort of feel your way into it. Um, if you really, I think for a return to work certificate after somebody's been sick to be PCR negative, that's fine. You probably only need to do that once. If you're trying to certify people as PCR negative 
over time, because they're working in nursing homes or something like that, you're probably going to be wanting to test them every couple of weeks. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, Ramesh, a few questions that have come in for you from the, the Q&A. Um, the first was really around you know, the, the, the question says, a man travels by bus to his work at a grocery store at a larger retailer, you know, a busy place. Um, and on the bus and at his place of work, he probably comes into potentially hundreds of people in, you know, three days before he tests positive. Um, and so how, you know, how is contact tracing possible or effective with such a large potential group, um, particularly when so many people may be unreachable um, or may be unwilling to be tested or, or quarantined? I mean, that's the, that's the challenge of um, contact tracing in general, which is you can have a lot of false positives and false negatives uh, in terms of who the exposed people could be. And on the other hand, it's not clear what they should do. So clearly in terms of software, it's easy to define a formula. If George tells us it's 10 minutes for with close proximity is the definition of uh, exposure, then that's easy to dial in into the software saying you have to be together for at least 10 minutes and how do we within a few feet of each other. So that's easy to do. And we can eliminate a lot of the false positives in that sense. The bigger challenge is if you're in a, if you're in a train or a bus in a car and, and there are hundreds of people, but you're wearing a mask or you, you're being very careful about interaction with others, then it doesn't really matter who was in that, who was in that environment uh, to some extent. So the context is very important as well. So a lot of kind of this you know, utopian, ideas of like, hey, the fact that two phones are next to each other is a great indicator is somewhat misleading because so much of it depends on the context. And that's why at Safe Paths we say it should be a multi-pronged solution using multiple technologies and also allowing people to do some kind of a self questionnaire. So the same questions a manual contact tracer would ask you, at least we can do some early filtering of that so that the manual contact tracer and rest of the public health can focus on the cases that really matter. So think of software as kind of an lead tree of this process, not an ultimate solution uh, for these things. And I would say that the Apple Google exposure notification that many of you may have heard is unfortunately is a risk in that, which is it will have a lot of false positives and negatives. People don't understand what the context was. All they know is on Tuesday you were exposed, but then not where, then it will reduce the trust in the system. So my expectation is that all these things will evolve over the next few weeks, uh, and you know, these kind of questions will start getting answered. All right, one maybe one quick follow up to that. You know, my my sense is that for technology assisted contract tracing to be effective, you need a significant percentage of the population who have a smartphone and who have you know downloaded the app and started to participate. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, do you have a sense of what that threshold for participation is? And you know, going back to the points that you've raised now a few times, how do you start to build that, build that trust um, and get enough people excited about this and, and eager to download the application? Yeah, so let, let, me, let me just say that uh, that's a wrong assumption that I think that the, what we have heard in media, like 50, 60% of people need to use a smartphone. It's for a very specific type of uh, you know, technology. Um, I think we can think of a very simple mechanism. You know, let's dial down the technology all the way and think of this very much like a you know, hurricane warning from National Weather Service. You know, even if you don't have a smartphone, you know, you will hear about it from the TV channels or news channels or newspapers and so on. And what we need right now is a very low tech, very simple solution where we need to change the policy so that contact tracers and epidemiologists can release an anonymized aggregated and redacted information of infected people and where they have been. Very much like they would release the hotspots of something else. And if they can release that in a newspaper on seven o'clock news channels, then anybody without any technology can see that and say, hey, I was at this wedding you know, at 5 p.m. on Saturday, or I was at this grocery store on Tuesday at 2 p.m. and I'm being told on the news channels that that's where the infection may have happened. And at least in smaller communities, this can easily allow us to get an early warning system, very much like we'd get an early warning system from a weather channel. All we are doing with technology is instead of having to check that, check that announcement every day at seven o'clock, you can get an automatic alert on your phone because the app can keep track of your GPS location or your Bluetooth trail 
whether you are at the wedding or whether you are at the grocery store, you'll get those alerts very easily. So, so Dakota, I mean, the solution has to be really simple. It should be used by anybody who don't have smartphones. It's just that in this country, we haven't changed the policy of releasing more information about the infected individuals in privacy preserving. We are kind of at the two extremes. Either in the US, only thing we're releasing is by county or the zip code level, or in Asian countries are releasing so much that you know individuals are concerned about their privacy. But I think there's a sweet middle that we should launch and this notion of having 50, and then even some of the people have apps, even 10% of the people have apps, they will get that alert and they can start informing people around them uh, and so on because you know they can explain to everybody around them. So, so I think it's a wrong way to say that some of the people need apps. So, I mean, perhaps this is a follow on. Um, one of the questions that we got through the Q&A channel was around, uh, you said, as retired clinical lab tech, I've been searching for teams of experts that are using analytical and AI software for effective data and privacy protecting collection of lab test results from labs, counties, states, federal agencies. I think to create, you know, basically the type of, you know, forecasting um, that you've described. Um, have you seen such a public dashboard? Is there anything like that on the horizon? Yeah, a lot of people have created wonderful dashboards, but you know, it's just like hurricanes in Florida. You know, they're so inaccurate uh, and there's a lot of shift. And in this case, the trust in the system is pretty low. And because we don't have controls, it's fine to say it's good to shut down now or good to open now, but we don't know what the outcome of the... So I think, you know, epidemiologists and statisticians have created great models to, to, to give us some forecast, but nobody knows if they're, if, they're, if, if they're right, you know. On the other hand, I think what George was talking about earlier, which is, hey, we don't know which tests are right, and we don't know, you know, uh, how long this immunity is. What we need is instead of thinking about this as a problem as hurricane where you deploy a top-down solution and everybody starts moving to safer places epidemics is a bottom-up problem which is it's a problem that is because of infected individuals and it's a problem because other healthy people get exposed right it's a people problem as opposed to the top-down problem that even a five or ten percent penetration of smartphones for this app would allow us to collect a humongous amount of data of which immunity tests are working or not, you know, which uh, policies of social distancing are working or not. You know, as you said, you know, maybe starting with healthcare workers and because of tradition, fortunately, uh, you know, a lot of these things can come through. So I think we have to really believe that instead of traditional statistical approaches, a bottom-up approach where the data is being captured from, from real human beings who are going through situations is going to improve the science uh, in, a, in a dramatic way. Um, Dr. Rutherford, you, you started in your opening remarks talking a bit about you know, the sort of range of different tests being used, so diagnostic and serological testing. And you know, in Ramesh's comments just now, he touched upon you know, sort of differing sensitivity and specificity of those tests. And so I'm curious um, you know, if you could just share a little bit more on the sort of reliability of the tests that are currently on the market, um, the implications of that, and then sort of, you know, what you think we should expect um, in the coming weeks and months regarding testing. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a question that, uh, it's an answer that changes probably twice an hour. So let me give you kind of a quick digest of it. The, um, this, the PCR tests, the viral swabs, are uh, highly accurate. Um, and they're, in fact, probably a little too accurate in that they detect minute amounts of the virus well after the infection is, is over. But for an acute diagnosis, it's our best bet. People say they're false negatives, which is incorrect. The test doesn't pick things up until three days post-infection. You have to get enough viral replication to actually be able to find it. If it's there, you'll find it. So they're not truly false positives in the sense of test performance. The problem with the, uh, with the antibody test is when we're screening a low prevalence population, uh, the, a large proportion of the, a, a significant proportion of the tests uh, will be false positives. And that's a, that's a problem um, because it leads you to overestimate the, uh, the proportion of people uh, who have had infection and leads you to kind of overcall what the, what the true prevalence of infection is in a population. So, but again, antibody uh, testing is really, I think, best used for understanding what the distribution of disease is in a population. For individuals, until we work out whether they're immune or not, 
it's, it's, you know, it's like my, my wife always wants to go get an antibody test because she thinks she might have had something in, in February and when we were in Berlin. And you know, it's a matter of curiosity. It has really no kind of prognostic or, or, or preventive uh, significance. So I, I basically say if you guys want, if you want to get an antibody test, get your doctor to order one. The commercial labs, the big health centers, Kaiser, UCSF, all use very highly reputable and as accurate as they get antibody tests. The problem is if the true level of, of infection in a, in a population is zero, every positive is going to be a false positive, right? So as we're down at like one, a half a percent, one and a half percent, a significant proportion of the, and by significant, I mean a third maybe, are going to be, uh, are going to be false positive. So if they're going to do it, they need to confirm it with a different antibody test which is what we, how we do it in our big studies. Right. I, I remember when we spoke last week, you were talking about, you know, sort of extensive studies that have been going on um, in San Francisco, in New York, um, in Northern Europe, uh, Italy, and elsewhere, um, trying to estimate the true prevalence of the disease yeah. in each of these areas. And I, um, yeah, I think that that was, I found that to be really surprising data and would love if you can share that with this group. Sure. I mean, it, it's, we're still trying to work it out in New York. But I'd be very, uh, so in Northern Italy, the prevalence of the population is about 4%. In Wuhan, it's probably about somewhere, it's less than 5%, probably like 2 or 3%. Wuhan in China, where the original outbreak was. In Northern California, it probably slightly more than 1% now, but like 1.2%, 1.4%, something like that. And it's, so it's, it's not like 90% or 80% or 40% or, any big number in New York, it might be pushing up towards 10%, but um, you know, there's not a really great cross-sectional sample of New York that, that, uh, that we can walk away with. Um, but even then, if you're gonna try and sort people into people who are antibody, you know, who've been infected and those who haven't been infected, there are not nearly enough people who've been infected to say sort out, you know, have a kindergarten with just kids who've been infected versus ones where, Kids haven't been infected. They're just not enough. Um, so the pre the prevalence is so low. Well, and and presumably, you know, I I know that many conversations, at least among my you know my family and friends, um, you know, there's been this sort of hopeful um, dialogue around when we will reach herd immunity. Um, and it sounds like you know what you're saying is beyond the fact that immunity itself is uncertain. Um, you know, we are a very long way off. Yeah, we're, we're a long, long way off, and to get there would cost probably tens of thousands of deaths in the Bay Area. So it's not a good mm -hmm. strategy, especially when we don't know whether you're immune or not on the other end. Right. So another question coming up in the Q&A um, for you, Dr. Rutherford, was that I've read that one of the problems of understanding COVID-19 is the ability to collect accurate data about victims. Um, and so what is being done by doctors and hospitals um, you know, to collect and report data about those that they are treating? Sure. Well, they're, they're elaborate. So if you have a positive test or, and if you have a negative test reported to the county health departments in California, that's where the, and, and those data are up daily um, at the San Francisco Department of Public Health website. So you can see what the proportion is of positive tests. One of the governor's criteria is to have a, a positive test, um, positive test rate kind of, of less than uh, 8%. And San Francisco is well below that. The, um, uh, when cases are reported, uh, we get elaborate histories trying to understand where they were infected, what risk factors they might have for progressive disease. Um, and then if they get into the hospital, they're large case series that really extract lots and lots and lots of data from them. So it's not so much that the patients aren't, the people with the disease aren't being studied it's that people with asymptomatic disease who do not present for diagnosis because they have no symptoms, are that those are the tougher ones to study. And that's the point of these large cohort studies to try and go out and find them at, in a, a more broadly in the population. Great. Um, and so Ramesh, I'm curious, um, you know, we've got a handful of minutes remaining, but um, you know, what is the current sort of status of the various pilots that you were discussing, um, you know, the technology platform, um, and sort of where are there opportunities for you know, folks to get involved, to use the application themselves, et cetera? Yeah, 
So I think you you probably heard about apps being deployed and you know not really moving the needle at all. In fact, creating a lot of confusion and so and so that's why we are not we we think we should continue to do a lot of pilots and learn from them quite a bit before calling it because it's easy to write an app and deploy. It's quite difficult to actually get it right and especially get it right in terms of its engagement with public health. So most of the pilots we are doing right now are in very close coordination with public health. That includes a lot of handholding, a lot of training, a lot of discussions, uh, and, and so on. And also legalities of it, the privacy aspects of it, and so on. So we continue to be in the pilot phase. At the same time, you can download the app, you can play with it, but we are not pushing it for a usage by an average citizen right now. We think in certain jurisdictions, those uh, states and nations will actually encourage their 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 uh, you know their citizens to use the solution that they have built in collab with us. Uh, at the same time, I think you know some of the real low fruits. I mean, if there's an app that just is a simple memory jogger that just says "Where have you been?" That's an app because if one of one of you does get infected, it helps the manual contact tracer to kind of jog your memory, right? Or having an app that just says hey, what are some instructions for me at this location at this time? Uh, you know, are we opening up, uh, you know, shopping malls or are the grocery stores open from eight to nine? So there's enough value that's generated by these apps, even before they do full-fledged contact tracing. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm, I serve boards for cities and states now uh, on the COVID response. And what is very clear is that the cities and states are also very eager to engage their citizens uh, as opposed to a traditional problem. So, so they need a mechanism to communicate back and forth as well. So a lot of our trials are looking at this whole spectrum, not just a full-fledged conversation, but also these early stages of interaction. And remember, SafePass also has public health-facing technology called Safe Places, which is a pretty sophisticated piece of technology with GIS and so on. Uh, and we do a lot of training and instructions, and we learn a lot from that as well. Great. So I think we only have a minute or two more before um, Philip jumps back in here, but I'll see have one final question from, um, from the Q&A. Um, and this, you know, Ramesh, this is something you hit upon earlier in your introductions, but I think just to, yeah, to kind of come back to it. And um, the question is, what is South Korea and China doing that, you know, either we don't want to do, cannot do, um, or simply are not doing? And, you know, what are the implications thereof for you know, sort of on a policy level, um, you know, how we should be thinking about our response. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Chinese story is, is not complete, but the students have done a very good job in publishing the whole stack of solutions. And when you look at it, you realize it's, it's not some gimmicky technology that has been introduced or some change in policy. It's really a multi-pronged approach and they have published a lot of data on what has worked and what has not worked. And when you look at that, it's very obvious. And I'll first want to say, that a piece of software is not going to save lives. Uh, so anybody who's kind of pushing these awesome apps and needs to humble, and I think to have a lot of humility in saying that piece of software is not going to do it. At the same time, technologies like contact tracing, technologies like a digital identity will and simplify the work of, of public health. So, I mean, I can't go into the details of everything the Chinese and South Koreans have done. There's some really good reports on that. But broadly speaking, what they have done really well is made sure the public health is at the, at, you know, is at the center of it and a whole bunch of incentives for individuals to participate uh, in the digital tools. So even for us at SafePass, we think exposure notification and contact tracing is a very small piece of it. But we have to look at the whole loop of triaging, quarantine verification, getting population back to work, working with employers in terms of their sick leave certification and so on. We need to look at the whole loop and provide all of that in a privacy preserving way, because as you know very well, the challenges in the spread are often happening in communities that are usually marginalized or they're concerned about, you know, being harassed by, by, by law enforcement or they're, they're worried about any kind of a stigma and so on. And, and so these are not, I mean, they are not the first ones to use the technology and buy the latest smartphones anyway. Uh, so we have to be very careful about how we deploy uh, all these solutions. And I think we can learn something from the Asian countries. Fantastic. Well, I know that we're just getting up um, closer on time. So Philip, maybe I'll turn it over to you for closing comments. Um, 
Thanks. Seconds, because we, we want to get out of here pretty quickly um, and be uh, sensitive to people's time. What is the one takeaway out of all of this that you want people to remember that you think um, they need to remember? Um, and while you're thinking about it, let me just go ahead and just tell everyone that, you know, we have here in front of you some pretty amazing people. We have uh, someone from MIT, Safe Pass, UCSF, um, the executive director of ID2020. Um, they're organizations that were all nonprofits, right? And these are very, very difficult times. And I know it's difficult times for everyone of you here, but um, every one of us wants to try to get involved and to help in many ways. So I would encourage you all to actually get involved in some way. And to the extent that you have a little extra funds, um, it's really tight for many people. We completely understand that. Um, you know, please help everyone. Um, with uh, with a donation if, if that's possible. But most of all, we want you uh, to get involved. Um, I also have been told uh, we have another program May 27th. It's called Advancing Community Rights Through Peace Building. You can RSVP at worldaffairs.org. So we've got about two minutes. Um, Dr. Rutherford, one thing, you know, that you want people to take away from. Are you on mute? That contact tracing is, is very important to the control of this pandemic at this stage as we move out of shelter in place and to please cooperate if you're called. Great. Uh, Dr. Raskar. Yes, um, it's, it's not like responding to a hurricane. This is really a community and a people problem. So as limited as digital tools are, it's very important for all of us to start participating in privacy preserving digital tools. And on the bright side, I think this might be the moment when we start creating digital tools that allow us to build resilient societies. I think we're gonna look back at this moment 10 years from now and say, because of this crisis, we all figured out how to come together in a privacy preserving, freedom preserving way so that we can coordinate with each other and deal with not just epidemics, but other types of crises as well. Okay, and Executive Director Gruner, Okay, um, I would I would really echo what Ramesh just said. Um, and I think the first is that you know, we think it really is a false dichotomy um, that one either needs to give up their privacy or um, you know sort of protect public health, and that we think it's you know not only um, possible to do both simultaneously, but absolutely critical we do so. Um, and particularly that's true because I think, as Ramesh said, so many of the tools and technologies that are going to be developed right now. Um, even while we are trying to ensure that they have a, you know, a shelf life appropriate for the pandemic response, we'll set the tone for the technology that's being used in the future. And so as we think about you know, building digital infrastructure that is important you know, in, the, in the immediate and you know, sort of useful in the long term, um, you know, now is the time to fight for privacy and to fight for um, really a rights-based approach. Okay, with that, thank you to our wonderful panelists. You, got, you all are doing amazing and important work uh, thank you to our audience for taking the time to be with us. Uh, everyone, please be safe and be well in this very odd and difficult time. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Thank you.